choice. Let me say that again. This is an exciting choice. The great state of New York moves that she be nominated for the office of Vice President of the United States by acclamation. Vice President, it has such a nice ring to it. When Geraldine Ferraro was nominated as the Democratic vice presidential candidate in 1984, she had no idea of the road that lay ahead. She would receive harsh criticism for her opinions and comments, and her family would become the focus of ugly accusations. I'm the candidate. I'm the candidate, not my husband. In her own words, that experience caused, quote, an agony that at times it seemed almost unbearable. Geraldine Ferraro has written a personal account of those days. We were at Wellesley College together on a day when you received a wonderful honor. Um, you have said, and I paraphrase, that if you had had a chance to see a videotape um, the day that Walter Mondale asked you to be the running mate of the next few months, that you might have said, thanks anyway, God, but would you give it to Diane Feinstein? <laughs> <laughs> Looking so. back, was it all worth it? Was it too tough? Yeah, it was, it was all worth it. Uh, no, it wasn't too tough, because as much as you see the lows, there were so many highs, and it really did make a difference. And the other thing I have to tell you is that since I've said that, I've sat down and, and continued that conversation with God. And suppose God had said to me, listen, Jerry, if you're not going to do it, I'm not going to let you pick the candidate. It's going to be Senator Lloyd Benson from Texas. <laughs> Would I then have said, God, I don't want to do it? Because I think we accomplished something in 84. We did have a woman on the national ticket. I honestly believe that Fritz Mondale did open doors of opportunity for women in this country. And I must tell you that since the campaign, the response of women all over the country has been incredible. It really has been. I mean, women coming up to me and saying, I went back to medical school because of you. If you can do it, I can do it. Um, you know, kids coming up to me saying, oh, I want to grow up. And Young girls, I want to grow up. I'm going to be president of the United of States. Lots of letters of support, I Amazing. know. Amazing. And it's still happening now. So I think if God had said to me, if it's not you, um, I'm not going to put a woman on the ticket. Please don't walk around thinking I have conversations with God like this, okay? <laughs> um, but then I, I, I don't know. I, I probably would have said, let's do it. The issue of the bigotry and the sexism that surrounded your campaign, mm -hmm. though, were you naive in thinking you could withstand those pressures? You no. Know, you know, the thing is, it's... Um, I guess part of it was that I didn't expect it to such a degree. Had I gone through some of this stuff before, sure. There isn't a woman who is, who is a lawyer who has practiced law uh, in the criminal justice field as I have. I was a, a trial attorney and a bureau chief in the DA's office who has an experience. But I can go back. There aren't women in my, my age category who have not felt discrimination somewhere mm -hmm. along the line. Mm -hmm. When I was getting ready for law school, I had the head of the law school say to me, Jerry, you're taking a man's place. Are you serious? I mean, and I, I went into law school. Two of us were in the class. Actually, the, the numbers, there were three in the total graduating class, mm -hmm. two in my session. Um, during the course of the, the cor classes, they would pick on us for all the almost embarrassing cases, the rape cases, the sodomy cases. I mean, you know, when you go to an all-girl school and all of a sudden you find yourself in class with all men, it, they were embarrassing. It was two firsts. The Italian American and the one where the, the first time that we've had either one of those that either that gender or that ethnic mm -hmm. group on a national ticket, Catholic, the Catholic of course we've had before with John Kennedy, Kennedy. but a lot has happened mm -hmm. in the past 24 years. So the 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 things that John Kennedy faced in 1960, the concern that if he were elected, that the Catholic Church would come in and and superimpose their will on him. Mm -hmm. As president, when he was running, he had to convince the American public that that would not happen. Whereas in this election, I had quite the opposite thing. I had to convince my church that I could not allow that. I think to later we'll focus an awful lot yeah. on that issue. Mother was the greatest influence, and I think the event that had the greatest impact was my father's death. In what way? Because because if my father were alive, I probably I probably would have continued to live in Newburgh. I probably would have ended up going to Lady Cliff College, which was very close there. I probably would have ended up getting married, and that would have been it, I probably, which is fine, which is fine. Um, but I think part of the reason why I have, I've spent my life being an overachiever, and, and uh, in some ways that's, that's not the best. I mean, it's, but it, the reason I am uh, is because when my father died, we had to do for ourselves. My mother became a single head of household. It was very hard for her to do. 
she put into her head that education was the most important thing she could give her children because she did not have a formal education and and so you know it was it was her pushing and my need to achieve even more in order to make it the reason I was an overachiever was because I I knew that if I didn't if I didn't reach and grab for whatever I could and, and succeed that I wasn't going to have a lot of things that I wanted. Mm -hmm. Your and mother showed you by example too. The day you were 16 years old, she told you to sew on beads because she was oh, sewing, she, beading all night long to make a living. For she you. she was a crochet beater, and you know what those the, they put the beads on the fancy dresses that women wear. You know, I have I have a lot. She used to make them for me too. I have some great looking things, um, but. She used to sew on beads, and she went like a machine. I mean, it's, it's not a, it's not a skill that's used in the United States or that women in the United States learn anymore. She learned it as a very young child in the sweatshops in 1910, 13, 15, somewhere around there. Um, but she, it's not a skill done here now. It's done very often by machine. But when it's done by hand, it's done in the Philippines, where you know wages are extremely low, and it's it's still almost slave labor. So she showed me how to. She she goes very quickly, and what you do is you put a bead on from the bottom, and you take a needle and you you go on top. And then there's a frame. I made it look as if I know what I'm doing, right? <laughs> when I was about 16, I was fascinated watching her, and I said, could you show me how to do it? And she said, all right. And I sat down and put one bead, and then went like this, and put one bead, and put like this. And it took me maybe 10 minutes to put on 10 beads. And she turned around to me, and she said, Jerry, do me a favor. Get an education, or you'll starve to death. <laughs> Team A, your friends, feminists who cared an awful lot about you, how did it come about that they, you decided to be groomed by them essentially for this? Actually what happened was, um, it was I guess in December of 83, we had, we had gone to the National Women's Political Caucus Convention in July of 83 and people were talking about a woman on the vice, as vice president and we were at a very small uh, caucus meeting, a Democratic caucus meeting, a small couple of hundred people compared to the number of people who was at the convention and I said, it's not going to happen. I mean, you tell me, are those guys going to put somebody in the ticket because it's the right thing to do? And I had some of the women yelling at me. There's a woman who's, who's just terrific. Her name is Millie Jeffries. She's an activist. She's in her 70s. She's one of the original founders of the National Women's Political Caucus. She's from Detroit. And she got up and scolded me in front of all <laughs> these women. She ended up being one of the women on Team A. Mm -hmm. And what had happened was these, she and a woman from the American Nurses Association, my administrative assistant, but that seven or eight women who were very involved in Washington got together and had a dinner and mm -hmm. said in December, we're, we'd like to not only push the idea of a woman for vice president, but would you mind if we drop your name? And I, I honestly didn't think it was going to happen, so I said, sure. Because at that time, I must tell you that what I was looking at was, I thought the idea of a woman on the ticket was dynamite. I don't think, as that woman said, that we were before our time. Mm. I think what happens, is I didn't think it was going to happen because you have to be put on by a male. So you have to candidate. make the time, is that it? And I, that's part of it. You have to make the time. But in addition to that, I don't think the nation would ever be ready for the first. I think you do it mm -hmm. and then you go on. Yep. I mean, you know, if if we had done it if we had done it eight years ago they would have said that they weren't ready. If we had done it sixteen years ago they would have said whereas it's done and now the next step is eighty eight, you're gonna see women running. But the team A, you know, did start dropping my name around. Let's talk about the meeting with Mondale when you first met with him and talked about it. Um, how did that go? You know, Fritz and I have known each other for a long time, uh, since 1978, and, um, and he's a good friend. I went out to North Oaks, and I hated the idea of being part of that parade. I, I, I don't know. I, I just felt uncomfortable with it. I felt uncomfortable. You mean the parade of women being looked at? As and everybody was going out there. I don't, I don't like being tested. I think it's part of it. I mean, it's, it's a personal thing, I guess. Um, I didn't like. I didn't think it was going to happen, so it just it just was not right. I went out, and we sat down for the meeting. And instead of talking about the budget, which I thought I was an expert on, <laughs> still do, still consider myself an expert, <laughs> because I was on the budget committee. I had been on there, and I really had studied the issue. And I had, you know, I I had been out speaking on the platform. Mm -hmm. I could have talked about anything. And, and they brought up the issue of crime, which went back to my DA's days. Mm -hmm. And and so we had a, an almost a nebulous discussion about that. After issue. that, we're going to see nomination footage in a moment, but right after that, there were leaks from, from AIDS mm -hmm. that, were, that were not pleasant at all. And you were asked to have your name pulled, and he said, I'm sorry, no more of that. Is that, is that yes. the way it happened? That's that's what happened on the Sunday after I'd gone out. Um, the New York Times read a, ran an article saying, you know, that I had done a terrible job and that there were leaks out that I was not going to be considered. And I must say, I was I was more than annoyed because my idea was I was going to run for the Senate in '86, and I said, 
if you don't want to pick a woman, that's fine. Mm. But don't destroy the women candidates that you have had out here in the process. Well, but it did happen, and let's yeah. look at it happening. Wonderful. <laughs> oh, with great feeling. Yeah, the thing is, it was the most amazing thing to feel because um, one one day I was a third term member of Congress who just could not wait to address that same convention for an hour as platform chair, hoping that they'd pay some attention to me. Mm. I addressed the convention in 1980, and when I went on to introduce Mo Udall, the cameras went off, <laughs> and nobody in the place was paying the least bit of attention to me. And so all of a sudden, I got up there, and, and they're all listening, and they're all, Isn't they're all involved. And you were ready for them, you know, too. Because yeah. Joe Mondale was wearing an a off-white suit. And you know, the mother of the bride, the mother of the group. <laughs> that was my staff. I didn't know that Joan was wearing that color. Joan was not involved in this this whole color thing. It was not Joan Mondale. <clears throat> Joan Mondale was the most wonderful person. You know, as much as it was difficult sometimes for me as the first woman on a ticket, you have to imagine how difficult it was for her. Um, I you know the thing is it's you know, because they were feminist groups, everybody said, Oh, they pushed too hard. You know, when don't you think there are people from the state of Texas who are pushing very, very hard for Senator Benson? Don't you think there were other Southerners who were looking at him? Don't you think? I mean, you know, that's that's part of politics. The people who are interested in getting their pe their individual on the ticket will push for them. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I really don't. In fact, I think I think what happens is we have to recognize that this is a diverse nation, and that tickets will be balanced in the future, um, without without. You know, elimination of gender is one of the, the balancing features. I would hope without uh, race being a discriminating factor against particular the campaign. <laughs> the campaign took its toll on your family, and uh, but yet I love it that you and John on February 10th of this year renewed your vows to say to the yeah. world, "Hey, the marriage is here to last." Well, we would, I have to tell you, the campaign actually, you know, f pushed him into doing it because I've been for a year and a half. I've been nagging as we've edged up to the 25th, saying. When we reach our 25th, you're going to remarry. We're going to renew our wedding vows. And he said to me, uh, oh, uh. Oh. Um, well, in, in fact, part of it was I'm going to trade you in for 225s, <laughs> that type of thing. And, um, <clears throat> and when it came time, I said, how about it? And he said, sure. How about the probe into his business and all of that stuff? Did it? Does that he's, still hurt? Because it's still going on. The Justice no, Department still oh, investigates. No, that's not him. That's me. Ah, uh, well. That's me. The Justice Department is still going on. It has been going on since last July. And as you know, as soon as I got the nomination, I was served with complaints by both the Washington Legal Foundation, which has admitted ties to the White House. Their directors are many of them involved with the White House. The um, Fund for a Conservative Majority, which is uh, a conservative group in, in Washington, and a guy by the name of Banshoff, who is a he's a, a lawyer with uh, George Washington. He always files these kind of lawsuits uh, against people. So in any event, what happened was they filed me with these lawsuits, and then as a result of those lawsuits being filed, uh, one was on the Ethics Committee stuff, and one was on the FEC stuff from 1978. Justice Department was also served, and the Ethics Committee stuff was decided in in December, uh, and they closed the case. The um, FEC had reviewed it in 1978, they reviewed it again, and they closed the case. But the Justice Department, even though those two have been closed, which is a little bit unusual, where the original complaints have been closed, they have continued to, to Will proceed. Will that hurt your running against Alphonse D'Amato? Oh, I, first of all, I don't know if I'm going to run against D'Amato, uh -huh, but secondly... That was up for a coy way to find out. <laughs> but, but secondly, um, <laughs> this has been going on forever. If I allowed I mean, I don't know how long this can go on. Maybe if I if I were to say, and, and others have said this, Jerry, if you just say you're not going to run, it'll end. I don't. I'm not that cynical. No. I really believe that that you know once they start, they've got to finish. But they're not in any rush. I can't let them determine my life, and so I will go on because they really don't have. I mean, if ethics says nothing and 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 FEC says nothing, and that's the basis of their procedure. All right, but the probe something. against John that I know it hurt you because in the book you write about the fact that although you were told not to cry publicly, and people wondered if a woman would cry, yeah. um, there was a time when you and John were hugging each other in the bedroom that, and crying. But yet again, you're confusing. That was the the when I we were doing all this stuff for the the press conference. Did you all see that? Mm -hmm. That huge press conference. When we were getting ready for that, that's when that took place. 
And that was, that was releasing his tax returns, mm -hmm. which he had said originally that he did not want to do. He's in the real estate business. And if you show your ownership of your property and then show what your income is from that property, it kind of gives people an idea of what your business is worth and what it's not worth and if you want to sell that property, where it's at. And so he didn't want to do that. Mm. But then we started to get hit so hard where people were saying they haven't paid their taxes. Actually, we paid more than most people did, especially people in our tax income category were saying, you're stupid for paying the amount of taxes you're because you're paying over 41 percent. The press wasn't good to you. Ted Koppel says now that he was too hard on you. Marvin Kalb during Meet the Press said to you, are you strong enough to push the button instead of focusing on whether or not you would, you would uh, fight the whole issue as a whole? And then that terrible story by, uh, what's his name, Guy Houghton from The Post, who, who said that your father had been in trouble and, and you went and did your own investigation on that, didn't you? Yeah. Um, I have to tell you that it, I've been asked about how the press treated me. And I, I must tell you that at the very beginning, it was partially my fault. I messed up when I said I was going to release my husband's tax returns and then all of a sudden said I wasn't. I mean, you know, that can make people frantic. Yeah. I didn't know how to deal with them. They didn't know how to deal with me. When we got through that press conference, we kind of had a mutual respect for each other. So I don't, you know, afterwards I got, if the press reported on me, if I did something good, they reported well. Mm -hmm. If I didn't, they reported, unfortunately, objectively. But the, the local press, um, there was unfairness. The New York Post, Philadelphia Inquirer, I found out the other day, had 37 investigative reporters on me. Now enough already. I mean, and, and the other piece, it's still coming on. And how many of the male candidates made Yeah, I, I don't think any, I don't know. But we had... We had, uh, near, Philadelphia Inquirer had a, after that was all over, perhaps to justify what they've done, I don't know, but since last January they've had another re investigative reporter working full time on a book on me, which should be coming out any minute, and uh, I'm not quite sure what it's going to say.